This is a little different to my other videos as I'm going to be doing a PC build video. I am building a lab PC for performance testing so I have some specific requirements around fast IO so I'm going to be picking components focused on this and talking about my choices, analysing the correct motherboard pick and then doing the build. I have a requirement for two Gen 5 NVMe slots for this so I'll be building on the X670E AM5 platform. Given AMD's incoming Zen 5 processor, there's also great deals to be had on Zen 4 processors and on the AMD AM5 platform, which will do the job just fine. So the CPU I'm looking at is the 7800X3D, which is widely respected as one of the best performing from the lineup and at a great price point. Yes, the 7950X is notionally faster with single core performance, it has more cores and higher clocks, but the improved L3 cache on the X3D and the scheduling issues with some multi-threading applications on the 7950X have meant that often the 7800X3D just outperforms, especially in gaming. And again, on price, the 7800X3D is great value. I picked up one from AWD in the UK for £315, and though they don't have that cheap right now, it's still £330 on Amazon and $367 on Amazon.com, which is still a great deal. It's unclear if they will drop much further as the new 5000 range comes out, though efficient, it doesn't seem to be blowing the 7800X3D away, and this still seems to be a great pick. So for this, I opted for the MSI MPG X670E Carbon. And this is one of the few MSI XC70E boards that gives two PCIe 5 NVMe slots. In fact, even the Meg Ace and the insanely overpriced Godlike only provide a single PCIe 5 NVMe, as do options further down the range. Asus do have options here in the Pro Art and the Rogue Strix, as well as the overpriced Crosshair Hero, but I wanted to do an MSI build this time. I do also want the NVMe slots to be easily accessible, as I'll be swapping them out often for testing. So for storage and the OS disk, I went for a Lexar PCIe 4NM790. For this drive, I actually wasn't looking for strong throughput performance, but at £120 for a 2TB disk, there wasn't a lot to be saved by getting a stick that even performs about half as well. And I wanted TLC NAND for endurance reasons. I'm going to be making a video comparing various NVMEs, but one of the things that is often overlooked is the NAND type and endurance. QLC cards provide good pricing, but they do have low endurance, and once the cache is saturated, they often perform pretty badly. I also bought a 5th gen NVMe to use for performance testing, and I looked at three options here. First of all, the Crucial T705 2TB, then the Corsair MP700 Pro 2TB, and then finally the Sabrent Rocket 5 2TB. All of these have fairly comparable performance, with the Crucial T705 and the Sabrent Rocket 5 especially close with 14.5 gigabytes per second read and 12.7 gigabytes per second write on the T705 and a slightly lower 14 gigabytes per second read and 12 gigabytes per second write on the Sabrin. They both also have similar write performance once the SLC cache is exhausted with the Sabrin edging out the crucial here by 4.5 gigabytes per second versus 4. They both also have 1200 terabytes written endurance numbers but I actually chose the Corsair MP700 Pro, which is a little lower stated performance at 12.4 gigabytes read and 11.8 gigabytes write, but it has an endurance advantage of 1400 TBW, and it also is significantly cheaper at 280 pounds versus the Crucial at 340 and the Sabrent at 329. These prices were the same both on Amazon.co.uk and on Scan. Next, I look at the memory, and I chose the G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo RGB edition, I went for 64 gigs of RAM, which I may actually upgrade to 128 gig later, uh, but do make sure you pick up the AMD Expo optimized memory. I've heard of people picking up the Intel XMP variants by mistake and, and having issues. These sticks are DDR5 6000 with the timings that you can see here, and these do review well and they perform really solidly on benchmarks. For the PSU, I had some Corsair HX1000 kicking around from previously. I've used these for years and I think they're great, they're quiet and they're solid. As this PC is primarily for I.O. testing, I won't be putting a discrete GPU in it quite yet. Not only do I not need a large GPU right now, but it will physically get in the way of my access to the board, so I will be using the built-in GPU in the Zen 4 chip. It's likely I will pick one up soon for both gaming, but also for other content creation work. As for the cooler, I love the Peerless Assassin from Thermal Right. AIOs or all-in-ones do look nice, and I won't say I wasn't tempted, at least in part to free up some space around the board, but I don't think the cooling is significantly better on the 7800X3D with a $200 AIO than with an air cooler that costs me like 40 bucks. but I'm likely to do some comparative testing in the future on this. I'll also be putting in a 2x10 gigabit Ethernet card, 
Um, I've used the NetGiga cards with the Intel X540 chipsets before, so I'll be getting one of those for this rig as well. And finally, what will I put all of this in? I look for a case for bench testing um, with easy access, and having looked at some options, I settled on the Core P3 TG Pro from Thermaltake. This case is modular, and it can be fully open, or it can be fronted with a toughened glass panel, which is great for accessibility and for cooling. It provides good options to keep the cabling neat, and I went for the Snow Edition, but they do have this in black also. As for the fans, it's an open case, and they're not going to be as effective for creating flow as a closed case, but I do want to draw air up off the cooler and the board, and I decided to test some Thermaltake Swafan EX14s, primarily for aesthetic reasons. They're the same colour as the case, and they attach magnetically to neaten the cabling. This case allows me to fit these either at the top or at the front, uh, but as I have no AIO radiator, I'm going to fit them at the top to help with airflow out of the top of the case. And to be clear, None of this is sponsored in any way. I did my own research, I bought what I needed. So let's get into the build. And I will, however, put the affiliate links to these items below to help you find the items I used. These cost no extra and they do help support the channel, so thank you very much. So the next step is to get the components assembled. But before I do, there's a few things to think about here. Firstly, there is a specific amount of bandwidth available to each NVMe slot, so I want the drives in the correct places. Before we start fitting components, let's take a look at the PCIe lane availability on the board so we know where the constraints are and where to fit the parts. And this will help you understand also why I selected the board that I selected. So looking at the board layout, we first see the dedicated 4 lane Gen 5 connectivity to the primary NVMe. This gives 16GB per second bi-directionally. The MP700 Pro NVMe I've chosen has a max read of 12.4GB per second and a max write of 11.8GB per second, so we're going to install this here. Next, the 16x Gen 5 connection to the first PCIe slot, and this is normally where you'd place a GPU. However, the Zen 4 CPUs have a max of 24 Gen 5 PCIe lanes available to the CPU. So the second Gen 5 8x slot shares the same 16 lanes from slot 1. And if you do want to use both these slots, then you must bifurcate these lanes, meaning that each slot only gets 8 of the 16 lanes, which can each run up to a Gen 5 speed, or 32 gigabytes per second. It's worth considering that if you do use both these slots and use a Gen 4 PCIe GPU, which right now you would be, then you'll only have eight Gen 4 lanes to the GPU. And this may actually impact the performance of a 4090 by a couple of a percent, but it likely won't impact other cards. The 5 Series RTX are at least rumored to be PCIe 5, which would make sense, and eight Gen 5 lanes would double that bandwidth to around 32 gigabytes per second. The Zen 4s also have an optional 4 PCIe 5 lanes which are classed as general purpose. So these can be used for a Thunderbolt 4 connection, and actually the Mag Ace and the Godlight boards assign this to a 3rd Gen 5 PCIe slot for some reason. This is the reason I picked the board I picked, as it's the only one in the range that assigns these to a 2nd Gen 5 NVMe. Next we see that there are 4 uh, DMI lanes down to the chipset, and despite the CPU supporting Gen 5 for these lanes, the PROM21 chips used in the X670 chipset support Gen 4 only, so this connection is limited to 8GB per second Gen 4, and it's probably the thing that is least well understood. This means that all of the connectivity we see via the chipset is constrained by sharing the same 8GB per second bidirectional channel. The B650 boards have a single PROM21 chip, with the X670 having two of these, and each of these has 12 Gen 4 lanes and 4 Gen 3 lanes, and this means that with the uplink and the downlink lanes, the first chip only actually has four lanes which can be connected to the remaining Gen 4 NVMe. This is where I connect the NVMe for the OS, saving the second Gen 5 slot for device testing. The second POM21 chip then has eight Gen 4 lanes available, and these are connected to the remaining NVMe and the third PCIe slot, which is a 4X slot only. And finally, there is the Gen 3 connectivity to the chassis USB 3.2 Gen 1 and Gen 2 connections, which are exposed on the front of the case. There is capacity on the board for some more of the Gen 1 5 gigabits per second ports also, as well as some USB 2. Um, these are all connected to the chipset, with USB ports on the back panel connected to the CPU. So the main takeaway for all of this is that the front chassis USB connections, the NVMe slots 3 and 4, as well as the dual 10 gigabits network card, they will all share the same 8 gigabytes per second of bandwidth of the DMI channel up to the CPU. So let's go ahead and install all the components on the board. First, you need to remove the socket protector. Keep this as you will need this on the board if you would ever need to RMA it. I would keep all the packing from the motherboard in its box and store it somewhere. The AM5 socket is an LGA type, meaning land grid array, and that means that the socket contains the pins. 
and these are small and they are very sensitive to damage hence the protector it's best not to touch the socket directly so the pins don't get damaged you basically probably won't be able to repair those pins if they get bent the cpu has an indicator on the cpu and the socket it's in the top right here you line these up and you gently drop the chip into the socket then pull the retainer back in place and hook it under the clip you should not need to use a lot of force here though there is a bit of resistance when you push the clip down the MSI MPG carbon board has a screwless design for the first NVMe slot. There's a push button release at the top here, which allows removal of the heatsink. Once the cover is removed, you can remove the plastic from the thermal pad and rotate the clasp so that the NVMe sits down flush on the pad. You can rotate the clasp back so it holds the NVMe at the end and keeps it in place. Next, remove the plastic from the heat pad on the underside of the heatsink. You can then hook the heatsink back in and push it down until you feel a gentle click as the heatsink falls into place. Check that it's seated securely. So if fitting two memory dims, you want to put them in the right place. If you open the clips at each end and hook one in first, the dims are keyed and only go in one way. Take a look at them before you fit them. And you do not need to apply force. If the dim won't seat, check that it's lined up with the slot and that it's the correct way around. So note that this board has two memory channels. Although it may be possible to fit RAM in any order, you will get the best performance if you fit them in a specific order and the manuals do dictate what you should do. The top two slots here are channel A and the bottom two in channel B and you should fit the RAM in channel A slot two and then channel B slot two and then come back to the one slots if you have more sticks to fit. Next, I'm gonna apply the thermal paste. The cooler comes with its own, but I'm using thermal grizzly here. There are different ways of doing this, but the goal is to ensure that once the cooler is clamped down, that there is an even coverage between the chip and the cooler. I prefer to pre-spread it rather than just using a pea-sized blob and having it spread under pressure. If you do spread it like this yourself, you only need a thin coat. Too much and it will just spread out the sides, make a mess and may not give an even surface. The thing is here, it's not too nil and not too much either. So ensure you have coverage, but don't go crazy. If you do think there's a nittle too much, you can take a spatula like this and remove a nittle. The Thermal Grizzly pack comes with one of these. Now we're going to attach the cooler, which is probably the fiddliest part of the process. But before we do, we do need to fit the cooler fixing brackets into the board mounting bracket. Many coolers come with various options to fit different socket types, so you pick the correct one for your board. In this case, it's an AMD AM5 socket. There are standoffs that need fitting, and then the bracket screws down into the mounting on the board. I'm orienting this to pull air from the motherboard back plate and push it towards the memory. Usually in a case, it might be better to have it pushed towards the back plate, where there's often a place for an exhaust fan. The reason I'm doing it this way is because the fans work best with push into the heatsink rather than pull on the exhaust side, and having a fan on the side of the memory means that either the RAM is not accessible or it's not visible, which may matter to you if you have RGB RAM. In any case, the case is also open, so pushing the air in a specific flow direction is a bit less important. And of course, this is one of the advantages of an AIO, that you don't have this mass of aluminium or aluminium if you prefer, and the fans all over the front of the socket. Another thing to note is that the PLS Assassin is not symmetrical either, and it's bigger either to the left or to the right in this view. So I'm mounting it to the right over the rear ends, and this is to ensure that the first NVMe remains accessible. Consider this when you're fitting your cooler, as removing the cooler is a bit of a pain as you need to clean and repaste the CPU to do it. So the fans simply clip on with a wire retainer and you can mount them higher or low on the cooler fin tower. I have mounted them a little higher to stop the fan clashing at the back with the VRM heatsink and the rear panel cover. You can pre-mount the fan that is on the outside of the cooler but you do need to leave the internal fan out until you've fitted the cooler because you're going to need to get down the stack there to screw the tensioners in onto the mount. Once the cooler is in place, screw it down into the bracket. Tightening this alternately on one side to the other to keep the pressure even on both sides. And this makes sure that the thermal grease is correctly distributed over the chip surface. And once it's on, we'll fit the second fan and clip it in. The clips go in from the front of the fan, which is on the intake side, and the clips go down onto the cooler on the exhaust side. The cooler has both power and RGB cables for the fans, we're just going to bundle these up for the time being and we're going to organize them once the board is in the case. Next, we're going to fit the Lexar NM790 NVMe, which we will use for the OS partition and general storage. We're going to place this in the M2 underscore 3 M.2 slot, which is the first NVMe slot attached to the X670 chipset. In this case, we need to unscrew the panel covering both the chipset connected M.2 slots, remove the protective plastic on the top heatsink, Install the NVMe, which has the same clasp as the first slot, and then fit the panel back in place. 
This card is rated to a sequential write speed of 6,500 megabytes per second and a read speed of 7,500 megabytes per second. So it's capable of reading to over 90% of the full four times Gen 4 speed of the slot and that of the shared DMI channel. Now let's get the board into the case. Boards have holes in standard places and we can screw in the standoffs in advance that the board will be mounted on. These ensure that the board itself doesn't come in contact with the case and could therefore potentially short. It's important to fit all the standoffs the board can use and no more, as missing ones can lead to the board flexing when put under pressure, such as when installing a GPU, which could damage it, and extra standoffs that don't match the board's mounting could short or damage components. In this case, there are nine standoffs, three along the top and bottom edges, and three across the middle of the board, right to left. Make sure all the standoffs are fully screwed in prior to installing the board, so the board isn't distorted during the install. Now, screw all the screws in partially first, and then go around and tighten them up after, and this is going to stop you finding that a screw won't go in due to an alignment issue. And then the PSU, which is usually simple, and especially with this case. In this case, I've mounted this with the fan down, so the fan exhaust isn't covered if I mount the GPU vertically in the future, which you have the option to do here. This also keeps the power cord at the back of the case and means the text is the correct way up, which is very important. And at this point we're nearly done, but first please do like the video if you found this interesting or useful, and also please consider subscribe also if you'd like to see more. I have a lot of deep dive content on PC components, storage, NAS and other tech. It's a small channel, so your support is hugely appreciated. You can check the links below for the components, and also do please share your feedback or questions in the comments. So, here is the end result. Firstly, the back of the case with the cabling organised and tied away, and then the results at the front. I have fitted the thermal take fans at the top, exhausting air from the cooler and the board area. I did fit the three fans magnetically to each other initially and used a single cable for the fan and RGB, but doing this adds around one centimetre or just under half an inch to the fan length due to the magnetic connector, and this made the fit so tight in the top panel that it made some of the interconnections between the fans a little unreliable. So, in the end, I cabled each individually to a separate fan header, but I've used a single RGB port near the bottom of the board near the USB connectors. So, thank you for watching. I really hope you like the build, and I will see you in the next.